After snapping a staggering 90,000 photos and countless hours of video, I'm here to give you the lowdown on whether the Canon R5 still reigns supreme in 2024. So grab your lenses and join me as we uncover whether the R5 is still worth buying or is it time to consider another camera? And I'm gonna start right now. The Canon R5 has been my main camera for both photography and video for the last few years. And I've just checked and I've taken a staggering 93,368 photos. So you could say I've used this camera quite a lot, but it's now 2024. And by my calculations, it's actually been out for almost three and a half years at this point, being released back in July 9th, 2020. So the question I've got is, is the Canon R5 still relevant? I think so, but let me explain why. So first up has got to be the sensor. It is genuinely one of my favorite sensors Canon have ever made. So it's got a beautiful 45 megapixel full frame sensor. And the colors are just beautiful. It's got those classic Canon colors in both photography and video. In photography, you're getting beautiful colors pretty much straight out of camera, and you've got a lot of manipulation. If you're shooting raw, which obviously I do recommend doing, you've got a beautiful amount of firstly dynamic range, and you've got so much manipulation over colors. I've used a whole range of cameras over years, from Fujifilm, from Nikon to Sony, and I've just, like the Canon colors. I just personally think they are my favorite. Now for video, you've also got great colors as well. So you can shoot in both C-Log and C-Log 3. I'm actually shooting in C-Log 3 right now, uh, Cinema Gamut C-Log 3, and it is genuinely beautiful. You've got great colors, you've got great fall off, lovely highlight and shadow retention, and the file sizes aren't big. So in photography, you're looking full frame, you're looking at around 45 to 50 megabytes, depending on your ISO. And then for video, you've got a great selection of bit rates. So you can film in all eye. If you wanna capture as much definition as possible, then you've got IPB, which is what I'm filming at the moment, and then IPB Lite, which is a really small file size, which I often use for wedding videos, because usually there's not a lot of movement in the shot. So you've got a great amount of selection over photography, you can shoot in a whole range of different JPEG modes, and obviously got raw and raw compressed. And then you've obviously got a great around selection in bit rates, all the way from all eye, all the way down to IPB. You can also film in a great amount of resolution as well, from 4K 120, all the way to 8K 30, and you can obviously film in 1080p as well. So genuinely, the sensor is by far one of my favorites Canon have ever made. Now, Canon are known for having a great autofocus system, and that's pretty much thanks to both the Canon EOS R5 and R6. It has lightning fast autofocus in both photography and video. Even recent firmware upgrades have allowed it to unlock certain capabilities that it didn't have when it first got released. So for example, Automotive, which was added with the R3, when a new firmware came out, it was also added to the R5 and R6. So it's nice to see that Canon haven't just locked it behind uh, a future camera, they've just basically backdated it to the R5 because they knew that it could do that, which I think is really nice. Now for photography, it has great autofocus in both human, eye, face and body, as well as animal and automotive. So really doesn't matter what type of photography you're doing, the R5 is probably going to have great autofocus. For video, it's still good, but I think other brands are slightly better. I think Sony have got a slightly better autofocus in video, mostly because you can control the speed. You can do in the cinema line, so I own a Canon C70, and you can control the speed of the autofocus in video because you don't want it to be like super snappy. You don't want it to go from one person to the other really, really fast. And the R5 has a tendency of doing that. So I wish, if there was one wish I could have for autofocus, I wish it could be just you could control the speed in video. Maybe you could speed it up or, or slow it down. That would definitely be helpful because it is sometimes a little bit too quick, which can make your videos look a little bit snappy and it can snap from one person to the other just a little bit too quickly. In photography, it doesn't matter. You want it to be as focusing as quick as the movements of the subject. But for video, you want it to be a little bit slower because you've obviously got to transition it. And that's the only thing I would say it's a little bit annoying, but autofocus is great for both photography and video. The form factor is great with this camera as well. As you can see, it's really small and lightweight. It's got great button placement, and it's got a great amount of resolution in both its EVF and LCD. But the biggest thing for me 
is it has got a flip out screen, which for a content creator or anything like that, allowing you to visually see if you're filming yourself is something that I can, it's just really, really helpful. Currently, I'm obviously filming on my other R5. I can check uh, my audio levels. I can check the histogram. I can check my composition. I can pretty much check everything. Although it's a little bit small, I can see it over there, which is really, really helpful. Now with the buttons, most of them are customizable. Not all of them, but most of them are, which is really nice. I've used a lot of cameras where you couldn't customize anything and it was really frustrating. So what's nice about this is you can really customize it depending on how you like working. So again, I'm more of a hybrid shooter. So that record button's a little bit too small and with the camera cage, it kind of covers it. So I've actually customized the uh, record button to be my main button on the front. So stop, start, record like you would do in photography. So that's something I also really like with the R5 as well. The only downside I would say is the form factor is also a negative. Uh, it can overheat really quickly just due to how small and lightweight it is. But to be honest with you, it happens very rarely and it's not a major problem for me because I'm not filming in really hot, bright environments. Most of the time I'm filming in an air con studio. But the biggest reason why I think the R5 is still relevant in 2024 has got to be the RF mount. The RF mount has got a great amount of lens options out there through neither native glass or adapted glass. I would actually say it's probably one of the best mounts that you could invest in. Yes, you've got Sony E-mount, which has got a great selection of both native and obviously uh, third-party E-mounts like Sigma, Zeiss, even uh, Tamron do great lenses. But I think that will come with the RF mount, which is why I still think the R5 is relevant. Now, I'm sure there'll be a few people in the comments saying, well, Canon still haven't released their RF mount to third parties, and you'd be right. But that's not going to be true forever. I think either this year or early next year, we're going to start to see Sigma RF lenses being released. But I still don't think it's a major problem because you can just simply adapt them. Pretty much all of my lenses, apart from the newer ones that I've got, are all EF. I've got Sigma EF, I've got some Canon EF, and they work beautifully with the R5. In fact, any RF mount camera. In fact, the RF has actually been adopted by other brands, like for example, RED, which if you think about it, RED has now been brought by Nikon, which means Nikon own a brand that use a Canon RF mount. It's a bit weird. And also you get really unique lenses as well. So for example, you get the Canon RF 28 to 70 mil. You get the brand new Canon RF 24 to 105 mil F 2.8. These lenses aren't available on any other brand. So just because the camera might be a bit older, the RF mount is a powerhouse of a mount. So we've looked at a few of the positive things, but this wouldn't be a proper review if we didn't look at a lot of the negative things. Now this hasn't got a long list, I've got to admit, but there are a few little foibles and a little annoying things that I do find with the R5. The first one and probably the most obvious one and a newsworthy one is its overheating issue. Now it has definitely got better since its release date. When I first brought it, it did have a tendency of overheating quite quickly, especially in certain video formats. Like for example, if you filmed in, I found 4K 50 and then you were filming in all I, that seemed to overheat it more than pretty much any other. And as well as if you filmed in 4K 100 all I, that would also make it overheat quite quickly. But they soon fixed that with a few firmware issues as well as you've got an overheating warning, as well as I adapted how I filmed. I brought an Atomos Ninja, so I filmed externally, and that pretty much fixed the issue. It's overheated me once or twice in the last six months or so, but most of the time I was filming outside in fairly hot environment. But if I'm ever filming in a studio, I have never had an issue. And if you're a photographer, overheating is something you're probably never going to run into. Next up has got to be that incredibly annoying 29 minute, 59 second record limit. Why it's got it, I have no idea. They haven't got it on any of the newer cameras, but they've limited this one, which for most people, it's probably never gonna run into an issue. But if you're a wedding filmmaker and you're filming long ceremonies and long speeches, having a camera that will just automatically stop recording at the 30 minute mark is just really, really frustrating. And it's the reason why I probably would buy another camera if you're a dedicated wedding filmmaker, maybe the R6 Mark II or even the R5C. So I just, it's just so frustrating. It's something that they could easily probably fix in a firmware, but the likelihood I'm probably gonna have to buy another camera to get over that hurdle, which is just a little bit annoying. The micro HDMI port, whoever invented that, 
yeah, that's it's just really frustrating. It's really small, which means it gets damaged really easily. Now, luckily, the camera's internal HDMI port doesn't seem to get damaged. It's always the cables, and I have gone through numerous cables. Ever since I brought my Atomos Ninja, I've probably gone through five cables, and they're quite expensive. They're like 25, 30 quid each. It's just a really annoying. They could have e easily fitted a mini or even a full-sized HDMI port on the side, but no, they haven't. They've decided to go for the micro HDMI port, which has a tendency of breaking constantly. And it's one of my biggest bugbears is I have to bring extra HDMI ports or micro HDMI ports just in case it breaks because it happened to me numerous times. And because I film externally now to an Atomos Ninja to get over that record limit, I can't have it break on a wedding. So I've got to buy multiple and it's just frustrating. No smart hot shoe. Now I get why, because they didn't invent the smart hot shoe until the R3, which is after the release date to this. But that's a reason to buy another camera is if you do want to use that smart hot shoe, it's not available on this camera. Uh, smart hot shoe allows you to do a few things. Like for example, obviously this has got a mic input. You can actually power uh, task cams with the uh, smart hot shoe as well as you can actually power certain microphones with the smart hot shoe but yeah not available on the r5 i can't really it's not an, a negative it's just a reason to buy another camera in 2024 and lastly has got to be it shoots on two different types of card formats now it's not a major negative because i'll explain why in a second which is why i wasn't sure to add it into this video but basically it shoots on cf express type b and sd which it's fine, it's great. You know, it needs to shoot on a CF Express Type B because it shoots in 8K and that's a lot of data transferring, which makes sense why it has CF Express Type B, which means if you wanna shoot in 8K, you can't shoot redundant, which is why I can't shoot 8K at any wedding. Now, what's really nice is the recent firmware update has allowed the R5 to basically shoot in 8K IPB, which means the files are far smaller. And 8K is great. I sometimes have it at the back of the ceremony so I can crop in if I need to because I have a 4K output for all my wedding films. But I can't do that because I can't shoot redundant and I'm not not shooting redundant on a wedding day. I need to make sure that I've got duplicate backups. So because of that, if this had two CF Express Type B cards, that would be amazing. But I get why they didn't do that, because that's really, really expensive and that would probably turn off a lot of people off. But for me, having two different types of car formats means I can't shoot redundant. And also, if I'm shooting redundant, it will only, the buffer will only be relatable to the slowest card. So yes, I might have a really nice CF Express Type B card, but I'm only as fast as my slowest card, which is the SD. So for buffering in, Redundancy mode, not great. Right, so that's enough of the negative stuff. Let's talk about my final reason why I still think the R5 is relevant, and that is price. Now you might be thinking, James, what are you talking about? Price? This is a £4,000 camera. And you'd be right. The R5 is expensive, brand new, coming in at £3,999. But I'm not talking about brand new prices, I'm talking about second hand. Because this camera is three and a half years old, there are a plenty of second hand options out there. In fact, if you go have a look at the MPB website, you can see that you can actually pick up an R5 for between 2,700 to 2,800 pounds, which is significantly less than the brand new price of around 4,000. And that's a big benefit of buying an older camera you can buy secondhand. If you wanna buy an R6 Mark II secondhand, you're gonna to have to wait probably another year or two before there's enough on the market to buy one. Sure, there might be one occasionally, but there's not gonna be one all the time that you're looking. For example, my brother, who's just brought an R6 Mark II, I recommended him to buy secondhand, but he couldn't because there wasn't one available. So the big benefit of the R5 now being a slightly older camera is secondhand options are firstly far cheaper and easier to come by. So yes, it's expensive brand new, but secondhand, you can find an absolute bargain. And there we go. There is my long-term review on what I think about the R5 and if it's still relevant in 2024. Me personally, I think it is, and there's more benefits than cons to this camera, but should you still buy one? Yes and no. I think if you're after a really good camera, perfect. R5 is going to be perfect for you, but it does have a few limitations on the video side of things, which there are other cameras that have fixed those issues. Take the Canon R5C, for example. 
no record limit, it's got a fan cord system so it's not going to overheat. Those two problems are solved. It's even got a smart hot shield on the top so you can use things like your task cams and inbuilt microphones directly on top of the camera. As well as the R6 Mark II, that's a great camera for about the same price, uh, second hand as the R5, brand new for the R6 Mark II. And you can pick that up with pretty much all of the problems sorted with the R5, but you're not getting that resolution. So write down in the comments below what you think. Do you own an R5 and still want one? Or have you more migrated over to another camera? I would love to hear your guys' feedback because genuinely, although the, I love the R5, maybe this might be the last year of me owning one. I've been James for Photo Fever and I'll catch you guys next time.